Right, so our presenter today is Sarah Romke. She's a graduate of a dual program, uh, MAS and MLIS, from the University of British Columbia um, in 2008. That's not so long ago, Sarah. Uh, she's the <laughs> Archive Matica Program Manager at Artifactual Systems. She's responsible for community management, requirements gathering, testing, and release management for Archive Matica. Uh, and uh, as you may know, Archive Matica is an open source software solution for digital preservation. And as an aside, uh, I've met Sarah in person uh, at UBC, uh, or at least in uh, Vancouver, at Enterprise Trust Meeting. So it's uh, wonderful that she's agreed to. Uh, speak with us today. Uh, and uh, Archive Matica is used by archivists and digital curation, uh, curators to process digital materials uh, and make standards compliant packages for presentation. So Sarah will give us an introduction to Archive Matica, how it's being used at large and small institutions. I'm eager to hear that myself. And then uh, discuss the importance of open source uh, for digital preservation. So I'm going to uh, turn this right over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Pat, for the invitation today. I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, be presenting um, on Archive Matica to all of you. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, um, Archive Matica is an open source platform for digital preservation. So um, that's what we'll talk about today and talk about um, how it's being used and how it's designed and what are kind of some of the principles that we follow when we're, um, when we're designing and, and releasing our Prismatica for use to the public. So um, our, um, our Prismatica is uh, developed primarily by Artifactual Systems and we're a company based here in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, we're the lead developers of both Archive Matica and another application called Access to Memory, or Atom. Atom is used for providing access to and, and describing archives online um, with using um, standards compliant uh, description templates. So Artifactual System is, is really a company that's led by archivists and librarians. It was started by um, a graduate of the same archival studies program that uh, I, I came through, which uh, the uh, person who started our company is Peter Van Garderen. He's quite well known in archives and technology circles. And um, he started Artifactual as sort of a consulting business, um, but quickly grew into software development where he saw some real gaps in the available tools for um, describing archives and providing access to them and also for digital preservation. Um, so the rest of our team, aside from us archivists here, obviously we have a lot of technologists here. So um, we have software developers on staff and systems administrators who help us uh, deploy and test and develop Archivematica and Atom. Um, but we're really uh, led by, um, by an archivist and by uh, our team of archivists. And we start with archival requirements when we're uh, looking to further develop the software. So uh, some of the salient features of Archivematica, um, it's important to us uh, to emphasize that it's free and open source digital preservation software and you can see our software license there. So we make all of our code uh, available to the public. So anybody can take a look at the code and understand if, they, if you have the technical ability to look at code and understand how software works, then it's all available to you. Um, there are a number of Archivematica users who are supported by us. Um, one of the ways that we uh, continue to operate as a small company is to provide support and um, hosting for uh, using Archivematica and Atom. But there's um, just as many, if not more, users who use the software because they've, they've installed it um, from, from its source and they're using it uh, without any uh, software licensing or so on. I'm going to talk a little bit later about how open source software is never actually free. <laughs> it's free in some senses and not free in some others. So we'll talk a bit, a bit about that later. 
Archive Medica uh, follows best practices and standards. Particularly, it follows the OAIS, or Open Archival Information System reference model very closely. And that reference model is the closest thing that we have um, in the digital preservation world to a real standard for how you should be preserving uh, digital content. At least it's the, the standard off of which we're all operating at the moment. We can never really say that the software com is uh, going to make you compliant with OAIS. Um, anybody who's familiar with the Open Archival Information System reference model knows that there's a lot of elements to that standard um, that have to do with human beings and have to do with uh, budgetary matters and policies and practices. And you can't really use software to make sure that you're compliant with those things. But we follow the reference model very closely. And if you use Archivematica then, and you're familiar with that reference model, then you'll see familiar terminology throughout. Um, we also use a number of other um, standards that are considered best practice in the community right now. Um, for example, we use Bagot to uh, package um, content that's being preserved through the system. Uh, we provide um, a way to enter Dublin Core metadata. And we have a very, uh, very robust premise in Met's implementation. Uh, my boss, Evelyn, who's the president of our company, uh, she's on the premise editorial committee. So uh, we're pretty, um, we're, we emphasize our, our premise implementation pretty heavily, and we're pretty confident in, in the way that it's being used. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. Part of being open source in our uh, definition of open source is that we have no barrier to participating in our in our user groups or community or our documentation. So you can find all of the documentation uh, for using our Cosmetica online, and as much as possible, we try to develop out in the open. So we try to put our requirements documentation online so that you can see what's coming up, and and after a feature has been released, you can sort of look back at the development documentation and understand what was the reasoning behind why we developed it a certain way. And the, um, the kind of fundamental goal of using Archivematica is to create consistent, system-independent archival information packages. And that's a term from OAIS. So it, again, if you're familiar with that uh, reference model, then you know what I mean when I say archival information packages, or APES, or AIPs for short. Um, so the idea is that Archivematic is really like a pipeline that you put your digital content in one end, uh, Archivematica helps you perform all kinds of digital preservation actions, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later. And at the end of the process, you've packaged your material together in a way that can be understood by other systems, uh, not just Archivematica. So it's really important to us that um, Archivematica can be used to create these archival information packages that if in the future you decided not to use Archivematic anymore, that should be fine. You shouldn't need to continue to use Archivematica to understand these, um, these packages that you've created for long-term preservation because you should never be relying on a single piece of software to understand content that you're trying to preserve for the long term. Um, that would just be creating another layer of complication to digital preservation, and it's complicated enough. So um, hopefully there's some Doctor Who fans in, uh, uh, listening to this right now because otherwise the joke uh, may be kind of lost on you. But we like to say that our Charismatica is bigger on the inside. And uh, okay, at least one person gets the joke, so thank you. <laughs> um, so the reason why we say that is because it's providing more than just a way to package things for storage. If you open up um, an archival information package that's produced by our Charismatica, you'll find metadata about your the files that you're preserving. You'll find logs that have to do with the, um, the actions that have been taken during the process of digital preservation. And you'll find uh, files in formats that are um, structured in such a way that help pr protect against software obsolescence. So one of the fundamental problems, of course, of digital preservation, as we all know, is that um, the, uh, t as time marches on, the formats become uh, more and more risky to use because the software to support them may go away. So um, we try to, to keep up with the community best practices in terms of what formats are best for long-term preservation, and we'll normalize the files that you put into archive 
Mathematica to um, suit long-term preservation. Having said that, all of this is very much up to the individual institutions who choose to use Archives Mathematica. There's a lot of flexibility in the system, and I'm going to talk about how you can change those rules and make your own rules and, and decide for yourself, uh, you know, what format should be used for, for future preservation or if normalization should even happen. You may want to take a different approach to digital preservation, and, and that's very valid as well. So as I said, um, Archive Medica kind of has this uh, fairly streamlined goal um, at the end of the day for being a complex system. It really is aiming to do uh, this one thing really well and then some other things also well, but this is really the, the core functionality. So what we want to do with the content that you process through Archive Medica is you want to create archival information packages or APES. And to do that, um, a bunch of actions are performed on your content as they make their way through the Archivematica pipeline. So we do things like integrity and virus checks, format identification, which is really important to, just to understand um, what should be done with the files to continue preserving them and continue processing them. And format identification may sound really simplistic, but um, we use tools in Archivematica that um, inspect the file using more than just its file extension. Um, for those those people who have um, a long history in computing and for anybody who's worked with files that were created long ago, um, file extensions are not a reliable way to understand files. Um, back in the early days of personal computing, they were used in all kinds of weird wacky ways to, uh, to indicate that a file was like a memo or a text file or whatever, and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the file format. So we use tools that allow you to get more precise information about the format uh, that you're preserving. So is it a JPEG, but what version of JPEG is it, for example? We do characterization of the files, so um, making sure that they um, fit certain criteria for being that kind of file. Um, metadata extraction, so technical metadata, when was that JPEG created and by what kind of camera and, and that kind of thing. Um, we've integrated certain forensic activities into Archivematica as well. Um, we're really happy to have implemented um, a tool from the BitCurator project, which is a project that uh, we feel is a really important one and one that really aligns really well with the, the workflows that Archivematica does and uh, their project really just aligns with the same kinds of uh, philosophical goals that, that we follow here. Um, so you can use uh, Bolt Extractor from the BitCurator project, which is something that helps you find personally identifying information within files. Um, we do format uh, validation, and you can also do some basic arrangement uh, and description activities, and we've integrated a transcription tool into Archivematica as well. So these are all actions. Um, some of these are actions that you would absolutely want to take on everything that you put into the system. Um, you, you know, doing a virus check is a pretty basic. Uh, uh, activity when you're doing digital preservation. Other things may be optional for you, and that's all quite flexible in the system. So if you don't want to do transcription of your files because um, maybe your files don't have text, maybe there are images that, that aren't, you know, scans of, of, of textual documents. Um, so you can skip the transcription activity. Uh, you don't have to do it um, if it's not relevant to your workflows. When you um, when you're working with files within Archivematica, um, I mentioned earlier that we have the option to normalize into uh, formats that are considered better for preservation. Um, so we try to follow as best we can um, the uh, current standards for what's considered good preservation practice. Um, but as I mentioned, and, and I'll talk about this in more detail when we actually take a look at the software tool, you can change all, all of these rules so that they suit your local purposes. Um, we use the Bagot specification to package together the AIP together with the logs and metadata, and the metadata is all recorded in a, a METS XML file that has a premise um, uh, within the METS. So um, you can, for example, um, Archivematica will automatically record certain uh, premise 
um, activities. So um, any events that have to do with, you know, your virus scans, your normalization and uh, format identification, all those things are recorded automatically without any intervention from you. But you can also manually write um, rights records using the premise standard as well. So if you want to, um, you know, have the, the copyright message um, in the METS file, you can do that, you know, if you need it there for longevity. And uh, finally, um, just another important characteristic of Archismatica is that it's storage agnostic. So what we mean by that is uh, if you have it installed locally um, on a, a server at your institution, then you can be sending your archival information packages when they're ready for storage. They can go to a local server, um, they can go to a mounted server, they could go to certain cloud storage integrations that we've um, done. So we've done integrations with Swift, with DuraCloud, with Archivum. Um, so we try to make it as agnostic as possible. Archivematic is not trying to fulfill your storage goal for you. Um, you um, it tries to handshake with as many different storage systems as possible. And the list is just growing all the time, and this is part of the model that we follow. So um, when we develop Archivematica, we use what's called the bounty model of open source um, development. And uh, so that, what that means is if, um, say, an institution has a need to integrate with a new storage technology that hasn't existed um, up until this point, um, then we'll, we can develop that functionality for them, um, artifactual systems can, and the next time that we release the Archivematica software, we'll include that new functionality in the general release. So everybody benefits from your institution's sponsorship of a certain feature or goal. Another um, kind of package that Archivematica can make is it can make uh, what's called, again, using terminology from the Open Archival Information System, um, it can make dissemination information packages or DIPs. So these are packages that are kind of purpose built for uh, access purposes. So uh, whenever possible, we normalize to access friendly formats. Um, depending on the kind of content that you're trying to preserve, there may not be an, uh, an easy to access uh, normalization rule to an access uh, format. So, um, you know, really specialized uh, file formats that are used in certain sectors like, uh, you know, research data and that kind of thing. Sometimes there isn't, a, there isn't really a good format to use for access purposes. So um, when it's not possible to normalize, um, we just make a copy of the original and that's part of your dissemination information package. And then as far as providing access to um, your digital content, what we try to do is we, we integrate or we call it handshake with a number of different access systems. So um, one is Atom or Access to Memory, which again is a piece of software that, that we develop here at Artifactual. And it's uh, used for online description and access primarily by archival institutions. Uh, we also have integrations with ContentDM, Archivist Toolkit, ArchivesSpace, and we also have versions of this workflow that work with Islandora and DSpace, but both of those currently work as a deposit system, so um, the workflow would normally be that uh, users are depositing material to Islandora or to DSpace, and then the material then flows through the system um, and arrives on Archivematica's doorstep to be preserved. Um, but we could develop in the future if, if it were sponsored by somebody who needs it, um, the, uh, the flow of content to go in the other direction where you start with Archivematica and send content to Island or, or DSpace, that would certainly be uh, possible as well. Um, so it, in our experience, different institutions have different reasons for the access systems that they've chosen. And in some cases, they have many access systems. Um, we have done a lot of work over the years with the University of British Columbia Library. They're one of our earliest Archivematica implementers and, and development uh, sponsors. And out of this list, they currently use three of those systems. So they use Atom for some content, they use ContentDM for other content, they use DSpace for some content. Um, so th there's uh, you know, a variety of institutional reasons, both practical and historical, why they use so many different access systems for different types of material. And um, our goal is to make Archivematica sort of the center of all of these in terms of the digital preservation activity. So 
we don't want to lock our users down to only using certain workflows for access. You should be able to describe content in whatever system makes the most sense for you. And Archivematics' goal is to handshake with that system so that you have a connection between the material that you're pro providing access to and the material that you're preserving for the long term. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, digital preservation is to kind of more generally and what some of the options are and this is sort of um, segueing into my pitch for why a system like Archivematica um, works for many institutions. <laughs> um, so you could rely on functionality within other systems. So if you're using a repository such as uh, something like Fedora or Hydra, there are certain aspects of digital preservation that are covered within those repositories. Within Islandora as well, that's another good example of a system uh, that covers some digital preservation functionality. And that may be enough for um, use cases within your organization. And uh, what I would advocate for is just taking a close look at what are your digital preservation needs, um, what are the use cases, and uh, what repository are you using, and does it cover what you need it to cover uh, for the long term. Um, there was a period of time, and for some people that still exists, um, we're using a homegrown system. Um, was their digital preservation um, works well. Um, so by homegrown system, I mean some kind of application that you've developed in-house. You know, there was a period of time when things like Archivematica and Preservica and Rosetta, these systems didn't exist yet, and all kinds of institutions were trying to tackle digital preservation, and a lot of them ended up kind of building a homegrown system. So some of the things to consider is that you have to maintain that code. It has no community of users around it, so there's kind of a sustainability of the tool um, that you have to consider. You and your staff are the only people in the world with digital expertise or with expertise in that particular system. So um, you need to consider that if you want to continue to use like a homegrown system over the long term. We have some users now who are moving themselves away from using a homegrown system and into using Archivematica because they just feel that it's a more sustainable practice for them over time. And one example of that is the Bentley Historical Library at University of Michigan. Um, they've been doing a major development project with us and have been blogging about the experience and it's really interesting to read uh, that blog and to, to take a look at where they've come from in terms of what they used to do for digital preservation and what they plan to do once they've implemented Archivematica and a couple of other systems for, um, uh, for part of their workflow. Um, another way to approach digital preservation is just to manage all of these digital preservation actions tool by tool. And that's kind of where Archivematica got its roots, actually. Um, Peter Van Gerderen, um, she was looking at the landscape of all of the really excellent open source tools that are available for performing different digital preservation actions. So for example, there's tools that you can use for virus scanning. There's tools that you can use for checksumming. There's tools that you can use for format identification. And he was thinking to himself, it just seems impossible that your average everyday archivist is going to be able to learn to use all of these tools. So you need a relatively high level of expertise to take this approach, and it's kind of difficult to maintain. It's also very difficult to record all of your preservation actions in a really consistent manner if you're doing that. So recording all of the output from the, those tools, you're probably going to be um, either doing a lot of manual work or um, writing some scripts to kind of connect all of the tools together. However, that's basically what Archivematica does. There's some, um, some scripts within Archivematica that are solely used by Archivematica. We're the only tool that we know of that are using them. We've written them to sort of uh, kind of make the tool one cohesive thing, but it integrates many, many tools um, that are available in the open source world. And um, we see this as a major benefit because it brings brings in all of this sort of um, uh, current best practice and uh, widely maintained and used uh, tools from across the digital preservation ecosystem. 
So finally, that brings us to the Digital Preservation Systems like Archivatica, and they come in both proprietary and open source forms. Um, so um, examples of proprietary versions are uh, software pieces like Preservica or Rosetta, and they have very similar um, kind of goals to Archivatica in terms of uh, looping together all of these uh, digital preservation actions into one cohesive system that is relatively easy to learn how to use, um, as opposed to uh, using all of these disparate tools from the command line and trying to figure out how to um, maintain all of the output from them so that you can store it with your um, digital archives for the long term. So why open source? Why do we choose uh, to take this route for, for Archive America? So it's, um, it's been a part of our model of development um, ever since we started. Um, Archivematic has always been an open source tool and it always will be. Um, we think it's really important for you to be able to understand your system and see what's happening under the hood. Not every user of Archivematica is going to be going into the source code and, uh, you know, poking around and understanding what's going on. But at least if, if you want to and if you have the ability, you can. And all of the output from Archivematica is uh, shared with you in a relatively easy way uh, throughout the tool. And I'm going to show you that a little bit in a demonstration later. Um, it's really important to consider the factor of vendor walk-in. So if you want to take your AIPs, those archival information packages that you've made with Archivematica, and store them in a totally different system and, um, and um, open them and understand them in different ways, you are 100% free to do that. There's no uh, requirement to continue using Archivematica um, going forward. And we think that that's really um, an important aspect. And if you were working with a proprietary vendor around digital preservation, I would personally be asking them a lot of questions about what happens when we choose to stop subscribing to your service. Um, because that day will inevitably come when you, when you want to use a different tool or you have to for some reason. Um, part of being open to us is also using open standards and open formats for metadata and packaging. So um, by using things like uh, Premise and Nets and Dublin Core um, and um, the OAX reference model, we're um, referring to open best practices that are widely understood throughout the community. Um, you also benefit from this sort of network effect uh, of information sharing and constantly improving tools. So I just mentioned how Archivematica uses all kinds of other open source tools. As those improve, they get folded into Archivematica and uh, you just continue benefiting from this sort of widespread use of the tools and also um, the ability of uh, the users to maintain a community within themselves and share workflows and share ideas and share bug reports and that kind of thing. And uh, finally, you get to actively participate in the future of the tools that you use. So if you have ideas about Archivematica, you have the ability um, and we welcome you to, to submit them to the community. Um, some users are, uh, you know, their institutions are financially able to sponsor new development. Some institutions aren't able to do that, but you can still participate by testing the software, reporting bugs, giving feedback, uh, sharing ideas on the user forum. That's all a way to participate in the open source community um, in a way that's kind of more difficult to do uh, with proprietary software. However, <laughs> open source isn't all um, butterflies and rainbows, and I don't want to pretend that it is. Um, so we like to say that open source software is more like a free kitten than it is like free lunch or a free beer. So if I take you out for a beer and I pay for it, then I've given you a free beer, and there's really very little commitment on your part. There's little that you have to do. But if I give you a free kitten, you have to take care of it. Um, you need to feed it. You need to give it a good home. You need to scratch behind its ears. Or someday it's going to leave you. And you're not going to have the benefit of having a kitten any longer. Um, so we're very open and upfront about this. We think uh, it's important that our users understand this, that if you're using open source software, you're going to be paying for it in some manner or other. You're going to be either um, 
paying in-house staff for um, IT support and uh, for installation and troubleshooting, or you're going to be paying a vendor like us to um, provide you with support uh, to help you out when you need it. Or you may be paying for hosting, uh, which is an option as well. Um, you do um, need some in-house technical ability or willingness to buy these services. Uh, so like I say, it's going to cost you in some manner or other. Um, really, those benefits that I just talked about, you'll find them most beneficial if you take the time to be actively participating in the open source community. Um, that's not to say that it's that you that you absolutely have to be on our user forum all the time to be using the software. Lots of our users aren't really participating in the the user forums or the user community that much, and that's perfectly okay. But I do think that you get a certain benefit from it that does take time. Uh, so if you don't have the time, you may not be feeling the, the kind of the full benefits of of using open source. And finally, institutional buy-in. Although this is really improving. So years back, like. I don't know, five, ten years ago, um, when archivists were going to their IT departments and saying, we want to use this tool, it's open source, you have to deploy it on um, Ubuntu, which is our preferred uh, flavor of, of Linux as a, as a server environment for Archivematica, um, IT departments were, you know, sometimes will say, whoa, 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 you know, we're not into this open source thing, it's too much work, it's too risky, we don't want to do it. Um, but this is really getting better and we've observed this over the past few years that more and more um, IT departments are happy to participate in an open source project, um, particularly if there's a community of support behind it and Archivematica is getting enough uptake now that um, it doesn't uh, scare quite as many IT people off as, as maybe it, it someday used to. Um, we have a colleague um, who uh, doesn't use Archivematica, but she uses our other software system, Adam, and she was really worried when she went to our, her IT department to say, you know, I've evaluated all of these different software tools and the one that I really want to use is Adam and it's open source. She thought for sure she'd be shut down, but her IT department was thrilled. Um, they were like, yeah, this is going to be really fun. We get to look under the hood of this software and we get to really know it and we get to play around and, and help you make some local customizations and that kind of thing. And, and they were actually excited for the opportunity. So maybe that aspect is getting a little bit better. So um, I'm going to um, leave this slide and open up a, um, a demonstration that I can show you. It won't be so much of a demonstration, it's more of a tour through Archivematica uh, to get you, give you a sense of what it looks like. Watching a digital reservation system work is not totally thrilling, it's just kind of watching <laughs> things happen to a bunch of files um, uh, in sequence. So uh, instead we'll do sort of a tour of Archivematica and take a look at um, where you can find user documentation and so on. So I'm just going to... Um, Okay, uh, so hopefully now you can see um, an Archivematica screen. Um, Pat or, or one of the other uh, moderators, do you want to just confirm that for me? I can't hear anybody else. I don't know if you're able to. Yes, I could see that. Talk. Okay, great, perfect. So um, this is what Archivematica looks like when you log into it. Um, yes, Archivematica is a web-based tool. It looks good. Uh, okay, great, great, perfect. Um, so um, as I was just saying, Archivematica is web-based, so you interact with it, most users interact with it through um, a web browser, so you'd use Chrome or Firefox uh, typically. Um, you can interact with Archivematica through uh, the command line if you prefer to do that. Um, but most of our users now, this is how they, they use Archivematica. So if you are, again, if you're familiar with the Open Archival Information System reference model, then you'll see familiar terminology here. So transfer, ingest, archival storage, preservation planning, access, and administration. These are all sections of that reference model. So that's not to say that by using each of these uh, tabs in Archivematica in turn that you are um, 
fulfilling all of the requirements of that reference model, but it's just to say that um, when you're taking actions in this part of our Seismatic Ed, this is the area of the reference model that you're working within. So the basic idea is you kind of go left to right. So you grab materials um, from a, a mounted system like a server or a cloud storage, um, and you get it into your Archivematica pipeline, and you start in transfer. And in the transfer screen, we can see here this uh, gray box that I'm kind of moving my mouse around right now. Um, this is representing everything that's already happened for a transfer that we moved into the system at, at some point. So um, this is a test server that we're using of Archivematica right now. So at your institution, you would have your own installation, and uh, you might have multiple installations, actually, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so this uh, package of materials has gone through the transfer process. And here you can see all of these microservices. And uh, a microservice is just sort of a category of jobs that need to be performed uh, for the content. So here, for example, I've clicked on the microservice scan for viruses. And it shows us the jobs that it has to do in order to be able to scan for viruses. If we want to see the output of the tools, we can click on this little gear and it will open and it will show us um, all of the output. So if you wanted to go through and really see and make sure that everything passed virus scanning, uh, you can do that. You don't really need to do that in terms of virus scanning because if you if it finds a virus, it just completely boots the process and stops it and gets it out of your system because you really don't want to be um, transferring in viruses into your digital preservation environment, obviously. Um, but the same goes for any of these microservices. They're all kind of grouped together, all of the, the jobs that are required to um, do everything related to the microservice. So here, for example, we have identify file format. I was talking a little bit about that earlier, how that's a sort of an important thing to do. Um, in the most accurate way possible for digital preservation purposes because it helps define how you're going to manage um, and uh, preserve that, those files over time. Um, so here, if we want to see the output of the tool, we could open it up and take a look. Um, so I don't know if some of you may be looking at this and thinking, you know, I'm not seeing output that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not really sure that I would be able to understand uh, what's going on in this system. Um, not, uh, not all of our users in not all of the, our workflows uh, really feel the need to look at this output. But um, my point in showing it is just to show you that it is possible to see it if you want to. Um, and if you do want to learn more about these tools, then looking at the output and starting to parse and ask questions to others who have more knowledge about, you know, what does it mean when it says that the command did this? And what does this error mean? Uh, we do a lot of troubleshooting through looking at this, um, the output of these tools. So uh, once all of these kind of uh, uh, initial transfer activities have taken place, the material moves into the ingest tab. And this is where Archivematica kind of does all of its um, work that leads up to packaging for preservation and packaging for access if you choose to do that. So here, that same example that we were just looking at is actually sitting at a microservice right now that's requiring a human to take the step of, of giving our pragmatica some instruction on what it should do. Um, so if you wanted to, you could automate all of the services all the way through, and you can do that in this administration tab. So all of these little checkboxes here in this list these all represent a decision point in the Archivematica system, either in transfer or in ingest. And if you want the same actions to be taken every single time, you can just click and choose what the action should be. Um, if you don't want it to happen automatically, you want a human to actually click and make the decision on a case-by-case -case basis, you leave it unchecked. Um, so we have... Um, we have certain institutions who are running Archivematica at such a scale that they have multiple Archivematica installations, which we call each one a pipeline. Um, so uh, multiple Archivematica pipelines running for different purposes. And part of the benefit of running more than one pipeline is that you can pre-configure 
for certain kinds of material. So for example, we have some institutions who have born digital material as well as digitized material. And they run very different processes based on what kind of material uh, they're uh, processing. So for born digital material, you're going to be concerned with things like um, um, finding uh, personally identifying information, for example. You may be um, only wanting to normalize for preservation and not for access because maybe it's your, you don't currently have um, a policy for providing access to born digital material. You may just have different processes depending on your local needs and your um, your policies. So in that case, it'd be advantageous to you to have one Archivematica installation that's running for born digital and another that's running for digitized that doesn't have the same needs. If you digitize the material, it's unlikely to have personally identifying information um, that may not be of concern to you. Um, so you can pre-configure the pipeline so that it skips that step and you don't have to run the process. Um, once material has been packaged for preservation, you'll find it in the archival storage tab. And it's listed here for easy access, but it's really just pointing to its ultimate storage location. So in this case, because this is a test server, um, it's just uh, the storage location is just on the same server that Archivematica is installed on. But if you um, use a service like DuraCloud, for example, um, you can store your archival packages in DuraCloud and retrieve them uh, from here just for easy access. So you can do searches for material if you want to find certain things. You can do a file search so that you can find individual files within the, the packages that you've stored. Um, the preservation planning tab is a really interesting area of Archivematica and I wanted to, uh, to talk about it a little bit. So um, we've made the preservation planning tab uh, so that it lists all of the rules and commands for the different preservation actions that you take in Archivematica. So along the side here, we have things like identification, characterization, extraction, uh, so that's like extracting um, packages, like zip packages and things like that, uh, normalization, transcription, and so on. So um, if you wanted to, uh, to take a look at some of the rules that Archivematica is going to follow to do certain actions, you can do that through this screen. And the rules that Archivematica comes with when you install it, it comes from um, something that we're calling the Format Policy Registry. So we maintain this database of formats um, that all Archivematica installations can uh, get access to. But if you wanted to, you could make local changes. So here, for example, under Normalization, I'm going to go to Rules. And I could search for a certain format. So um, for example, if I wanted to search for um, DNG or digital negative files, then I can see that for different versions of a DNG, it has rules for access, and it also has rules for preservation. So for access, we can see here that um, if you uh, tell Archivematica to normalize for access, by default, it'll take these uh, various versions of digital negatives and it will make a copy of them um, to JPEG um, using a script that we're calling Convert and it's using Image Magic as the backend tool for that. So if you wanted to replace that, say um, you have a, um, an access system that needs TIFFs, not JPEGs. So you could replace the rule I'll just load in a second here. You could replace the rules so that it uses a different format. So if you wanted to say change it to TIFF instead of JPEG, you could do that. If you want to change the command, you can do that as well. So again, under normalization, I'll go to commands. And um, you can see the different commands that are listed here. So um, if you want your uh, TIFF files um, created in a certain way, you can open up this command and you can replace it. And if you have some knowledge of, um, of the tool that it's using and how it works and how you write commands for it, you can make changes here. So for example, you might want to write a command that makes a TIFF of a certain size um, because that's what you need for your access system or something like that. Um, so there's a little bit of, um, of 
um, uh, programmer knowledge that would be helpful to have here. Um, but it's the kind of knowledge that I think a lot of archivists and librarians and curators would certainly be able to learn and obtain if they don't have it already. And if not, then like somebody in your IT staff would probably be the people to, uh, to help you uh, with this. And you can always ask for help on a user forum as well, of course. So I just wanted to show you that um, that this system of um, of rules and commands is meant to be quite flexible so that um, if you have local needs, you can uh, address them. We have sort of a future goal for this, uh, this format policy registry to take it and make it so that you can share your rules with others. So um, for example, one of the sort of powered users, I guess you could say, on Archivematica is MoMA, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. They're using Archivematica to preserve time-based um, art artwork, so things that are like, uh, you know, video recordings and things like that. So um, a smaller museum may not feel like they have the, the same level of expertise as a place like MoMA. So they may want to look to MoMA's rules and say, whatever you're doing for preservation planning, we want to do similar things here. And they'd be able to share rules back and forth if you choose to do so. So um, that's uh, just kind of an idea, a, a vision for the, the format policy registry that we have. Uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to achieve that, um, certainly if it was of interest to uh, an institution to sponsor, it would be really interested in talking to them about it. But we've set it up in such a way that that kind of abstraction from the system is possible, so that you don't have to use the um, kind of uh, out of the box rules that that Archivematic has. Um, so I'm going to take just a few minutes to talk about um, a few of the documentation sources for using Archivematica. Um, and then we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. So uh, this is the Archivematica website. You can find it at archivematica.org. And under documentation, you can find uh, documentation for all of the recent uh, versions uh, that have been released. So if you were using version 1.4, you'd go to that documentation. And uh, the documentation, uh, similar to the software itself, um, also refers to the Open Archival Information System reference model. So here under transfer, you'll find instructions for all of the relevant um, uh, uh, activities that you do in the transfer tab, same thing in ingest, and so on. Uh, so all of our documentation is completely open. Anybody can access it. You don't need like a login or anything. It's not behind a paywall. So uh, feel free to take a close look at that if you're interested. We also maintain a wiki. And uh, the purpose behind the wiki is, um, well, it used to be our only source of documentation, actually. But uh, now what we use it for is primarily uh, for development purposes. So. If we go to the development documentation section of the wiki, um, we can go to, say, for example, requirements and look at um, a feature and find out more about how it was developed and why. So um, one of the big things we've been working on right now is um, this new tab that, that um, we've been developing with the Bentley Library um, call, that we're calling the Appraisal and Arrangement tab. So if you wanted to read up on some history and uh, kind of figure out like why we did this development and how, um, see some early iterations of what it was going to look like and then see how that changed over time, um, then we try to make as much of this kind of documentation as open as possible so that uh, this, we just think it makes the software more uh, usable by, by more people um, if you can understand uh, how it was developed. And then finally, if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, you can look at our code. So um, we use uh, GitHub to manage our code. Um, you'll find us at github.com slash artifactual. And you'll see all of our projects there, including our Chismatica. So if you really wanted to get into the uh, code and see uh, how our, our Chismatica is developed um, and you have the technical knowledge to do that, then, then you're welcome to do so. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen so that I can go back to the Blackboard. And um, I'm ready to, uh, to take questions from any of you. So uh, please uh, go ahead and, and shoot. <laughs> Hi, 
I think you could either type questions into chat or um, use your microphone if, if you have it connected to, um, to ask. I see Lori is typing something. Did you want to take the mic, Lori? No, no questions from me. I, I have my own Archive Natica sandbox, as you know, so um, I'm, a, I'm a pro Archive Natica person um, and I love the work they've done and I think it's been a very useful thing for our community. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. Anyone else have any comments or questions? I, I have a question. Okay, go okay. ahead, Sandy. Um, what was the name of that museum in New York? I didn't I didn't hear that. It was it MoMA. Yes, it was MoMA. Okay. Thank you. So MoMA, um, they use Archismatica, and they also helped us develop a new system that we're calling Binder. They're currently the only user of it, <laughs> but we're, we're hoping to change that really soon. Um, there's some, uh, so we, they, had a, they had digital preservation management needs that Archismatica wasn't really meeting on its own. So things like um, reporting and statistics and connecting, uh, kind of connecting the dots of things. So if you're preserving an artwork that requires a certain piece of hardware to run it, how do you manage that information? So we built this new application for them and it's called Binder. Um, and we've open sourced Binder, we've put the code up online. Um, but there's some challenges uh, relating to making it work it, like outside of the MoMA context. Um, so we're currently pursuing opportunities to make it more generally usable. But um, if you look on uh, YouTube, if you search for MoMA Binder, um, you'll find some presentations and screencasts about Binder and why it's important and how they're using it. And it's a pretty interesting tool, so I'd, I'd recommend taking a look at that if, if that interests you, particularly if um, artwork preservation uh, is of interest to you. It's a really interesting tool to look at. I guess I mean digital artwork, really. <laughs> it has nothing to do with managing, you know, uh, like physical conservation of art. <laughs> I'm going to thank you for presenting to us today and turn off the recording. And if anyone has a last minute question, I'm sure you'll be able to get it in. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you.